Today I can give you guys maybe three topics and then choose which topic you want me to talk about. One topic I really want to talk about is مَا مَلَكَتْ أَيْمَانُهُمْ And I know my sisters will be upset with this, but it is about what the right hands possess, the captives of the war. That is one topic that's on my mind. The second topic is number 19 in the Qur'an. Let's leave it to these two there. I have other topics. But which of these two would you like me to talk about? The first one. <laughs> well, dear sisters, huh? the young guys want to know about what the right hand possesses. The unmarried guys. No, why would I be interested in talking about this? Like getting a boyfriend girlfriend? <laughs> no. No, that's no. The reason I'm interested in talking about this topic is because, number one, non Muslims raise this question that how come <laughs> Islam allows what they call concubines? And it's a serious question. The other reason is that there is a reason Quran mentions this and it has to do with Islamic eschatology in the future. Because in the future, we know what will happen. That there will be more women than men. And so something will have to be done and there will be wars and you will have issues in the wars that will have to be dealt with. So what is وَمَا تِلْكَ وَمَا مَلَكَتْ أَيْمَانُهُمْ And what their right hand possesses. Why does the Qur'an use the word right hand? Because it is trying to do something good with a group of people that have become an outcast of society. Why have they become an outcast of society? Because when there is war, especially in free industrial times, if there is war and you capture people, you also, and who is the most vulnerable of those prisoners that would be caught? Women. Women will be what? The most what? Vulnerable. Most vulnerable in a prison situation. So, the Qur'an sets some rules. We do not take the men or the women and put them in Guantanamo Bay. No, we don't do that. We don't do, what is it called, board wa waterboarding? Waterboarding? Huh? Waterboarding. Waterboarding, where you put water on a person so much that they can't breathe? You don't do that. Because we have good intentions, that's why we call it وَمَا مَلَكَتْ أَيْمَانُهُمْ What their right hand possesses. In the war, when you capture the people, the other side has also captured them. Why do we capture prisoners? We capture prisoners so we can trade the prisoners. Give us, your pris give us back our prisoners and take back what? Your prisoners. This is the way of the world. That when there is a war, there are prisoners on both sides. For example, when the United States l waged a war in Afghanistan, a female journalist came in the hands of Taliban. Very important female journalist. What was her name? Ridley. Ivan. Ivan Ridley. She was a prisoner. She became Muslim after being their prisoner. After reading the Quran, they treated her like a princess. But that's not my subject. I'm saying that when you have when you have war, you will have what? Prisoners. Prisoners. And the prisoners need to be what? 
traded. Well, who will be on the list of the people that they will want to trade? Men or women? Women. Huh? Men. Men. They want their warriors back. And in the olden days, they felt that, oh, now that she's gone to the other side and they've caught her, she's become, you know, unholy or whatever. So we don't want her back. We don't want them back. Keep them. And so the Prophet used to do this, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is he would trade the prisoners. Even till today, they do this. Every day they do this. Palestine captures the prisoners from the Israeli army and trades them in for the Palestinians that they've caught, even till today. Now when you have women captured in your army, what should you do with them? How should you treat them? They're the most vulnerable group. They're the what? Most vulnerable. Most vulnerable group. And so the Quran tells us, and the Prophet tells us that now, let's say at the end of a certain battle, you've caught some women. And the army has to go back after how many months in Islam? Twelve? No. Four months. Four second months? You're only allowed to be in the battlefield for four months and then you have to come back and you exchange. You don't keep somebody in a war zone for ten years. This is unjust. You don't keep somebody in war zone for twenty years. This is unjust to the people of your own people. And so, four months, after four months, what will happen? The army that went first will come what? Back. And a new set of army will go. Now, when they have these prisoners, they have to manage the prisoners. What should they do? Should they put them in Guantanamo Bay? No. Should they treat them badly so they can get the secrets out of them? No. Should they torture them? No. Should they torture the women? No. What should they do? So the Amir of Jihad, he is told, well, we have five women, or we have ten women, or we have X number of women. And the Amir of Jihad says, okay, I will hibba. The word Imam Nawi uses is hibba. Hibba means what? Gift. I will gift. But you, I'll explain to you, it doesn't mean what you're thinking. I'm going to put these women in the responsibility of X, Y, Z man. Why would he do that? The Amir of Jihad, what is the foreign policy of Islam? The number one foreign policy of Islam. The foreign policy of the Khilafah. Or the foreign policy of Medina. What is the foreign policy of Islam? The foreign policy of Islam is the propagation of? No. It's the propagation of Islam, inviting people to Islam. And the best way to do that is to bring the prisoners into the city of Medina and let them see the environment of Medina. And so the Amir of Jihad says, Let's see who's not married here, because if I mention a married brother, I might get in trouble. <laughs> That's okay, it's okay. So our brother Zahir is the Amir of Jihad. Inshallah. And he says, Miles, the sister, we've caught her. You have to take care of her. Take her back into the city. You take care of her, and your wife take care of her, and your family take care of her. Right? So now she's under the care of a righteous man. Right? So when she goes back, people know that that lady is in the care of Brother Miles. So the neighbors will not have their eyes on... What? Their neighbors will not have their eyes on her. Because if he brings her as a slave, without authority over her, what will every, all the neighboring men say? Oh, there's a beautiful girl there. A beautiful girl came into the city. She'll be in the most vulnerable situation. She'll be what? 
in the most vulnerable situation. So she comes in the authority, and now no one knows what is the relationship between Miles and this girl. Maybe they have a close relationship. Maybe they just have a friendly relationship. Maybe they just have a business relationship. But he is the one who's taking care of her, financially and so on and so forth. He gives her a chance to learn about Islam in Medina or in the place of Hijrah. And she gets to learn about Islam. And 99% of the time, what happens? She becomes Muslim. Because she finds out that I'm being treated better than my people that did not even want me back in their society. There's many fiqhi details. I think Hadaya, do you know the fiqhi book, the Hanafi fiqhi book, Hadaya? I think almost 25, 27% of the whole book is on this issue, on the issue of Mamalakat Aymanuhum and slaves and so on and so forth. So it's a lot of details. But I'm trying to show you the wisdom Islam has. That when we do hijrah on a certain land, and there are issues or crisis and things happen and women come, how will we deal with that in an issue, in a state of war? What do we do with the captured women? We have to take care of them. We have to provide for them. We have to use that as an opportunity to introduce them to Islam. And that is why the Quran uses the word وَمَا مَلَكَتْ أَيْمَانُهُمْ and what their right hand possesses. Because the man that is being put in charge of these women, the Amir of Jihad is responsible for making sure that he gave these women in the hands of a just man, of a just person, a person of fatwa, a person who will be fair to them, a person who will stand up for them and who will provide for them. And if need be, will get them to their family or married or whatever their negotiated relationship would be. And he will make sure that the neighborhood he's in, no one treats her like an outcast. And so this is the foreign policy of Islam with women that are caught as prisoners of war. What about men? Same thing with the men. The Prophet ﷺ caught men and he told these prisoners of war, teach them how to read and write. That's our prisoners of war, not Guantanamo Bay. And they're more likely to tell you secrets if you treat them nicely than they are by the way that they've been doing. And so our foreign policy is that one. Even, well, I'm not going to talk about that right now. But I think, <clears throat> now let me mention something important. Very soon, there will be more women than men. Inshallah. Inshallah. <laughs> I will tell you why, inshallah. Because they deserve that slap in their face for making fun of the Prophet. And they will be forced to deal with that situation in no other way other than the way the Prophet taught to it for it to be dealt with. But anyway. So we have to start thinking about, and over here, let me mention, why does the Qur'an mention the, the women of the right hand? The Qur'an didn't have to mention it. <laughs> but the Prophet told us, <laughs> there will come a time, <laughs> that the 
slave girl will give birth to her what? Master. Master. Meaning, slavery will officially come to an end. When did that happen? Where the mother was a slave and the daughter was? A free lady, and she was like a master over her mother. The United Nations, or at that time, it was not called the United Nations, it was called the League of Nations. They passed a law that we are officially ending what? Slavery. Slavery that they had, not ours. By the way, in our history of slavery, there's a lot of positives and a lot of negatives. As you get further away from the Prophet, it's more negative than positive. It's not a good history if you're being honest, because even though the African Americans were brought from West Africa, a lot of the people selling them were Muslims. Selling them to the white men. That was Muslims doing that. But what I want to emphasize is that the slave in the time of the Prophet used to be called Ab. A what? Ab. But when the Qur'an started using the word Abd for the slave, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ Muslims stopped using the word slave. They would say Mamluk. Or they would say Mawla. The one who is taken care of. Or the one who has an agent. Or the one that is Mamluk. That is our responsibility, our tamliq. And so Muslims start using the word slave completely. So the Quran talks about وَمَا مَلَكَتْ أَيْمَانُهُمْ and it hints to the fact that a type of slavery would come back. When would slavery come back? After the time period where there would be a slave, and the slave would give birth to a free person, a master. After that period will come again another period of slavery. What does that mean? We live in, and slavery is what, especially from an Islamic perspective, it is an economic system. It is what? Economic system. An economic system. You have the master and the apprentice. The master and the apprentice. apprentice is one economic system. And then you have the employer and employee economic system. When the cities fall, when the nation cities fall, and the Prophet said the last city to fall in the nation of Islam will be which one? Okay. Medina. Medina will be the last city to fall amongst the cities to fall, amongst the cities of Islam. The last city to fall will be? Medina. Medina. When the cities fall, the old economic system will return. <coughs> when the old economic system returns, there's going to be no Sears and Walmart and Target and let me be an employee there, no. I might be all alone in the wilderness and I see a group of people and I say to them, look, I will teach your children to read and write, but can you clothe me and can you give me food? I will do work for you. Take me into your shelter. And they may do so or they may not do so. So the old economic system will return. This is what the Prophet ﷺ told us. And the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and this is the reason that the Qur'an mentions, because when the Qur'an mentions something, when the what? Qur'an mentions something, it is the universal. When Qur'an mentions something, it is the universal of history. This 309 years that we've had of modernity, this is just a flash that is going to die out. But the majority of history, we've had the other economic system, the master and the apprentice. And that is where we're going to go back to. And the narrations of the Prophet are correct, in which the Prophet says, 
the Isa alayhi salatu wasalam who killed Dajjal with a sword. And the best of the cavaliers will be the cavaliers with the Mahdi. The Prophet said, the Sahih Bukhari. And the Prophet said, I could tell you their families and who they are. Each one of them, I could tell you who they are. And so the Prophet said, they will be the best of the riders, meaning riders of horses. That system, that economic system, that system of riding horses will come back. And the traditional methods of taking care of society will come back. And the traditional methods of taking care of the downtrodden in society will come back. So, is somebody knocking on the door? I think I've said enough. أقول قولي هذا أستغفر الله لي ولكم لسان المسلمين والمسلمات السلام عليكم